Hey people, thank you for stopping by Building Wealth with Raji. If you're interested in gaming and want to know what gaming stocks to invest in and how to analyze them before investment and how to beat the market, you should listen to this conversation with Bertrand. He goes by the name of App Economy on Seeking Alpha. He's been able to beat market for several years. Obviously, this year is challenging for him as it's for other investors. If you enjoyed the chat, please follow the channel, subscribe to my channel, share with your friends. Do give a comment on what you think about the conversation. You've been beating the market for some time, I mean, for a couple of years. And uh, how do you do that? Uh, well, yeah, let's say uh, I've been uh, very lucky to be in a position where I've been uh, well ahead of the market for the past, uh, let's say, uh, seven, eight years where I've been starting to invest seriously uh, in uh, uh, individual stocks. Uh, so it, it's been quite a ride over the past year, you know. Uh, uh, for growth investors, it's been a, a challenging environment. Uh, so the, the returns are uh, not as far ahead of the market as they used to be. Uh, but, you know, that's uh, that's the beauty of the process. Uh, that's uh, kind of something also I wrote about a lot on Seeking Alpha, where, where I talk about just uh, managing drawdowns and uh, keeping a long-term mindset. So mm. that's kind of what I, I discuss all the time with the community of the, mm. um, App Economy Portfolio, which is my, my community on Seeking Alpha. Okay, so so uh, let's divide it in two parts now. Uh, one is mm -hmm. this year. I think this year is an anomaly. You know, it's a, it's a bit of a difficult year for the whole world. But before that, uh, what was your strategy to to pick stocks uh, to uh, to do well for yourself and to well for your subscribers and your followers? Yeah. Um, so I, I think it. Uh, we have to go to rewind a little bit. Go back. To, let's do that. Uh, <laughs> something like 15 years ago uh, when 2007 I existed a business school in France at the time uh, and uh, I, I was basically uh, I did a master of science and management and specialized in finance at the time I joined PricewaterhouseCoopers which is one of the the big four in financial audit um, so it was basically the Financial, great financial crisis started shortly after that. Uh, but I, I basically built my financial background over there. And then w I was eventually recruited by a, a large uh, gaming publisher called Bandai Namco. Uh, if you don't know them, they're the company behind Pac-Man, uh, Tekken, all the you know anime titles like Dragon Ball, Naruto. They are usually uh, published by that uh, company. Um, and they, they released a, probably the biggest... Uh, video game this year in 2022 called Elden Ring, which is a, a role-playing game on consoles. So uh, one of uh, my achievements of my career has been to have my name in the credits of Elden Ring. That's uh, uh, the story there. But um, uh, basically working in gaming has really uh, shaped uh, my view of uh, what a good business is uh, because what I've been doing is uh, financial planning and analysis. So you know, we talk about big games being released. Uh, I've been the guy who people come to and ask, how many units are we going to sell? Mm -hmm. How is this game going to do? Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell me how many, can you tell me the revenue we're going to make in the next five years based on the, the plan we have right now? Mm -hmm. And so I was the person actually building those forecasts, actually seeking ways to improve revenue, focusing on corporate strategy and things mm -hmm. like that. So uh, this has definitely shaped the way I, I see what gives me confidence in the, the near term and the long term and what, what makes me pause. Um, so the, the way to think about it is uh, really how video games have evolved in the past 20 years. Uh, I like to say that video games are a few years ahead of everything else in terms of uh, consumer adoption, uh, consumer trends, and, and even the technology itself. Because um, if you think about it, 20 years ago, you wanted to buy a video game, you, you had to buy a disc, you know, on a, on a shelf at a, at a store. Um, so just like any piece of software, the music industry has been through that too, you know, a shift mm. from physical to digital is a big one. Um, but we had many other shifts uh, in gaming, the shift from consoles to mobile, and now mobile represents more than half of the revenue. Um, the, the shift from premium, you used to be able to spend $60 on a game and now you can play it for free. So the free to play model as was questioned at first, people didn't get it. And now people understand that this is the way you make money on games. Um, 
that sense of competitive competitiveness with esports, you know, those global events that involve uh, that become really social platforms. And um, I would add to that just the way these products monetize. So we went from full games to digital uh, goods, basically, or virtual goods that are added to the experience. Uh, subscription models that have been embraced. So imagine for someone like me who has to forecast those things and who sees in real time what the profitability of a game becomes when it moves from a retail product where we give away our margin you know, to retail plus manufacturing goods to first party things like that. And suddenly we have those game as a service models where you can make money for years out of the same franchise just by adding more content and maintaining a sense of community. So it's a completely different beast, right? We, we've also increased the predictability, the hit rate uh, for, for a lot of franchises because we changed the approach. And going through that has taught me, okay, how do I find around me businesses that are also benefiting from these tailwinds that maybe used to be average businesses or businesses that have their own challenges, uh, and that are now improving their margin, creating a revenue base that is recurring, uh, sustainable, kind of predictable, um, and also generally benefiting from just large tailwinds. You know, gaming has been one of the fastest growing entertainment segment you can come up with. It's, it's going to be, uh, it's ahead of the S&P 500, if you will, like it's 11-12% CAGR, something like that. So, um, all that put together has really shaped the way uh, I look for opportunities out there. And then I, I built up from, from that. So uh, that has led me to, of course, invest in some companies that are very obvious today, but were not necessarily at the time. So okay. um, uh, that, that has helped my performance. And then I, I shaped this portfolio that I call the app economy portfolio, because really the common denominator in all these companies the, the greater theme has been companies that benefit from the overall shift to mobile, the shift to the cloud, the explosion of data that we see, what are the businesses that are powering it on the consumer side, and that's, you know, gaming companies, maybe an Airbnb, a social platform, things like that, but also on the back end, what are the companies that power that shift to the cloud? It could be, you know, from semiconductors to hyperscalers, to the, the companies uh, for uh, managing the infrastructure uh, and also just generally enhancing those tools and make them work together. Nice, very nice, interesting. So one experience in life leading to another one and another one leading to another one. That's, mm -hmm. that's basically what I'm hearing. Okay, so gaming, okay, let's talk a little bit about gaming. What, what are your best bets in gaming? What you see the companies around, what is the sustainable, which companies do you think come around uh, you know, as as massive uh, uh, advantage to you in the world of gaming because it's such a jazz word. Everybody wants to invest. We'll buy Zynga, buy this, buy this. Or oh, gaming is great. But you know, what's the what's the truth out there? Can you separate the noise from the from the from the facts? You know, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a. Uh, I've been a believer in gaming for a very long time. You know, it's uh, maybe uh, since my when I was a teenager. You know, I really uh, enjoy gaming, and even though I spend less time now playing in my adult life, I continue to really see it as a great way for people to be engaged with content. Uh, the storytelling has greatly improved. There is a, a ton to love here, um, and wh when you think about gaming, it's a challenging industry. Uh, it can be hit driven. Um, you know. Uh, so it goes in cycles. Some companies may have uh, a cash cow with one or two games, and then uh, they they can struggle to find a new, a second wind, if you will. Um, so having been on the forecasting side of things, that made me relatively cautious over time, even though I, I invested early in some companies like Take-Two, Interactive, or Activision Blizzard. Uh, but over time, I actually did not keep them in my portfolio because I felt like, uh, even though they were very fine businesses, I was more interested in the platforms that win no matter what. Okay. Um, either, either because uh, they take a share, right? So the Apple and the Googles of the world, they take a 30% share 
of everything that's going to sell through their store. So they are the biggest gaming company in the world, if you will, mm. right? Uh, I am invested in Tencent, which is technically the biggest game publisher in the world. Uh, I have other positions in companies that have a gaming component, but in general, it's not the only thing about the company. And that includes um, a company like NetEase, um, NTS, okay. which is uh, also one of the largest publishers in the world, um, and uh, a company like C Limited that has also a very large gaming segment, Garena. So those are interesting to me because uh, they create a cash cow through gaming and they also fund other activities, uh, new uh, initiatives through that cash that they raise. So that, that part really uh, stuck with me as something that I, I really value compared to the pure plays, uh, it's called them pure plays. Other examples I can mention are um, companies that are doing something different. Uh, I have in mind Unity, uh, which is okay. powering really um, gaming. So uh, powering the tools to enable developers to create fantastic experiences. So they also win no matter what, right? They win with the developers who are going to create hit games, but they don't have to release hit games themselves. Um, and, and another one that uh, I, I have on my radar that's also in my portfolio is Roblox. Um, though I would not buy Roblox at any price, I would say. So uh, the community knows when I, when I look at Roblox and when I'm really to, ready to, to move. But basically, Roblox is a very fascinating company too because they win with developers. There is that sense of win-win uh, that I look for. Like if a lot of people are rooting for your company to succeed because a lot of uh, other actors win with you, that's really something that makes me buzz and, uh, and usually that, that turns me into an investor over time. Okay. And... Uh... Why wouldn't you invest in Roblox, sorry, when you like the company so much? Why wouldn't you invest in that? In what company, sorry? Ro Roblox. No, I am an investor in, in Roblox. Okay, you are an uh, investor in Roblox, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I have a small and, position. And now with the, with significant price uh, reductions or significant uh, bear market now, uh, if you want to need to pick top two gaming companies, Bertrand, pure gaming plays, what would those be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... a. Uh, you know, um, I tend to re reassess every month. So what what I tell you today might be different. You sure, know, sure. a month from yeah. now, yeah. Uh, because because the way I think about it is, you have great companies, and then we want to make sure we build up positions when when there is an opportune time to to just build up, right? To add mm. brick by brick to a position. Mm. So, um, you know, the past few weeks I've been uh, looking again at semiconductors uh, because. Uh, Paradoxically, their, their gaming segment is somewhat fading, right? Or is expected to fade mm. after big tailwinds during uh, COVID, right? Mm -hmm. With the demand, the demand mm. toward those uh, semiconductor mm. companies has increased greatly. Uh, but you know, with PC gaming rising to the top, uh, remote work creating new demand for PC mm. at home. So uh, I look at Nvidia, I look at AMD, uh, really like what I see. Uh, especially the near-term outlook. So three to four years, just earlier today, AMD uh, had its investor day, uh, financial analyst day. And they, Lisa Su is confident to say, you know, next three, four years, 20% CAGR revenue growth. And when you look at the operating margins, the, the free cash flow margins, these are very impressive businesses. They, they won't take long to you know, justify their valuation, despite the fact that they are way down from their peak, they are still not cheap, uh, make no mistake. But at the same time, now they look interesting. I wouldn't have bought them a year ago, but now I look at them as, as a pretty great opportunity to get exposure. And as I mentioned before, not just to gaming, but kind of like uh, encompassing also data centers and automotive, plenty of other things that you get on top. Um, I really like these kind of opportunities. So I've just done a video which I released three days ago on NVIDIA uh, mm -hmm. saying the same thing that it looks like a great opportunity to me at this 180 kind of pricing with the tailwinds they have. Uh, you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, I recently uh, 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 bought NVIDIA. So yeah, I cannot agree more. This is, uh, this is one of the stocks featured on the service this month for this reason. 
Yeah, but pure gaming play, there is no pure gaming play for you. Like, you don't think that people should take a position in Unity. I think it's been hammered quite a bit. Yeah, uh, I like Unity. Uh, I've built up my position slowly last year. Um, you know, there, there was a bit of a snafu recently. They, mm. they had an issue with a data dump that was that had some uh, some problems. So they, they had to lower their guidance quite a bit. Mm. Um, so I'm kind of uh, holding off for on Unity right now. Um, not willing to add to my position just yet. Mm. I'm trying to see where, where this goes. I continue to be very bullish on the company long term. Mm. Uh, but I kind of want to see evidence that the uh, the issue that they just had is going to be um, a one-off. Uh, and if so, you know, there is going to be plenty of time to build up that position. So right now, uh, I'm, I'm just holding my position. I'm very, pretty happy with where the company is headed. You know, that I think it's um, the CEO said that, you know, business like life um, has, a, you know, ups and downs. And you shouldn't expect just the business to be on a straight up line up and to the right. And, you uh, and that's exactly how I think about investing. You know, I don't challenge my uh, my thesis at the first sign of a challenge. And uh, I like to to keep eyes on the price. Is the thesis intact? The general uh, trend uh, of the business is the how the fundamentals still sound. And I think that's the case still for Unity for sure. All right, nice. Now you said you you evaluate your. Uh... He says month to month. Does it mean that you sell often? You sell your equity, oh, you sell your holdings? Does it mean that? Yeah, no, good question. It's actually, uh, so what I meant was I reassess every month where I think the best opportunities are, okay. right? So that, that's what I reassess every month. That's why I was just uh, touching on, oh, what I think is the best opportunity right now may be different a month from now, right? Especially in this market that is very volatile. Um, however, um, it's a good thing you're asking that because uh, that one of the things I read about a lot on Seeking Alpha is how I rarely ever sell. Um, and that's something that's not going to make everybody comfortable. Uh, I'm aware of that. Um, it's, uh, I, I take from um, Robert G. Kirby. Uh, who wrote about the coffee can portfolio. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is something that, uh, that's also in uh, Thomas Fell's book, 100 Baggers, Chris mm. Mayer touch, mm. touches on that too. So it's just this idea that, you know, you have, um, and uh, Peter Thiel talks about that in um, uh, just uh, the power law in general. So mm. if, you, if you invest like a venture capitalist where you have 100 position, the top 20%, so 20 position will probably generate all the returns and compensate for all the all the losers at the bottom of the portfolio okay. right? and so I, I have this in mind i'm aware that tw about 20 percent of my investments are going to drive the entirety of my returns and okay. if you extrapolate that 20 percent of those so probably out of 100 investment assuming you have a large portfolio probably only uh something like four or five investments are actually going to be the, essentially uh, what's going to drive the returns and being mindful of that, what it make, it makes me really think about my my winners as my main source of alpha. I want to let my winners run, and for that reason, uh, sometimes some of my winners, you know, will especially in the current market, they may actually do a round trip, right, and they may go back to where I initially started my position, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with a position going to zero. If you, I don't know if you're aware of this data, but um, you know, the Black Star Fund had looked at the Russell uh, 3000 over 25 years. There were uh, only one third of stocks that performed the market, something like that. So you can beat the market. You're an excellent investor, even if you're right only four times out of 10. You're already ahead of the market, right? Mm. Uh, and so accepting that you're going to have a ton of investments that don't work out is very important just in the, from coming from a humility standpoint, but also realizing, okay, uh, another data point from Black Southern was 25% of stocks drive the entirety of the market. And so if, if you mess around, if, you, if you're like, oh, Salesforce is up 100% in the past two years, really, the stock has done well, let's sell it. Well, you probably let out of your portfolio one of the best company performer, you know, of the past 20 years. That's probably a mistake, right? So I've made these mistakes in the past. I sold Amazon in 2016 thinking I was a genius, 
because I secured my gains, right? So because I've made those mistakes um, and I look back and realize, okay, th there are so much money left on the table. Uh, I, I need to stop tinkering with the mm. portfolio. I need to just let it ride. And sometimes it will cost me dearly, but mm. you know, the, co the cost of holding too long a company that becomes a loser is marginal. Assuming, you know, you take a, a 2%, 3% position, that's all it's going to cost you if it really truly underperformed down to zero. But the cost of not holding on on a compounder, you know, that's going to go 5, 10, 20 X, that's really where the magic happens. And that's where you can damage your portfolio. So, so I think that brings to me two questions. It means that mm -hmm. and my thinking is that you have a huge emphasis on portfolio sizing then, because if you, if you don't portfolio size and if you don't sell, I think then, you know, probably your portfolio is not very concentrated. It seems, I mean, I mean, I'm just trying to hypothesize here because if you have five holdings, 20% each, you know, if, if, if screws up, then you got to sell it. I mean, but if you have 2%, then you probably may not. So I think, is it a, is it a portfolio diversified, concentrated? What's your, what are your, what's your thinking? Yeah. The, those are the, the good questions, Rajiv, because, um, so you tell me if I'm concentrated or not. Okay. okay. So there is a little bit over 80 position in my portfolio. Okay. Okay. Uh, sounds, ri sounds ridiculous, right? Um, my top 10 position are 50, about 52% of my portfolio. My top 30 position are 80% of my portfolio. So again, just my first, my top two positions are already 20% of my portfolio, 21%. Mm. So my point here is that that's exactly how the power law works. So if you want to have half of your portfolio in only five to 10 companies, and those to be the winners that drive it all, if that seems reasonable to you, it certainly does to me as a good level of concentration, you know, half of your portfolio in 10 companies, that's pretty great. Well, to get there, I had to invest in 80 companies so that I have the 20% of 20% that really drives it all. And I like, I always talk about this uh, uh, in the articles where I fo focus on mindset. If you invest only in let's say 15 companies, there's only two companies that are going to drive half of your portfolio because that's the way just the power law usually works. There could be an exception here and there, but that's, that's just the way it, it's going to happen and the portfolio will naturally concentrate over time. And that is assuming, you know, like me, you, you don't really tinker, you don't rotate out of positions and you let them ride. And so you're, you kind of have to expand a little bit the size of the number of positions you invest in Otherwise, you end up very concentrated, you know. Um, so I'm not concentrated like uh, Buffett, you know, who has 40% of his portfolio in Apple. But uh, I'm not that far because just my top 10 is at 52%, which is um, uh, something I feel good about right now. And if you ask me again in five years, I will probably have 80% of my portfolio in my top 10. Because again, the biggest winners, most likely they will combine into even bigger positions and I'm unlikely to trim them. So, so if you ask me, then uh, it's a diversified portfolio. Okay, so no, let, me, let me tell you why I'm thinking like this, but it is worth having a discussion on this. I think mm -hmm. the, the, the question of having a diversified and concentrated portfolio, in my view, and you know, I'm still learning, is the starting point. If the mm -hmm. starting point is five companies, it's a concentrated portfolio because you divide it 20% each. But if the starting point is 50 companies and you let five companies grow and they become 50%, you started with the concept of diversified portfolio. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you get a point? So, so if your starting point was, okay, I'm going with 30 companies or 40 companies. And then over a period of time, five years, as you said, 2% or 5%, 10% of the companies do better and they make this kind of structure. Then you started with the concept, you're a believer of diversified portfolio and let the winners run. Is that, is that, that does make sense to you? Absolutely. And that's, that's really the way I invest, you know, starting from a diversified basis, mm. not letting, not letting conviction take over. I, you know, I'm really impressed. I respect people who are able to only invest in 10 companies in a, a portfolio that re mm. re represents, you know, a large portion of their assets. Mm. I really appreciate the confidence. Uh, I've, 
I've learned that my conviction has no correlation with the performance of the stocks I invest in. Uh, what I've learned is that uh, oftentimes, you know, I think I have a big winner on my hands and it turns out it doesn't, it doesn't work out. And, you know, luck is an immense factor in investing. Um, and we, I try to balance it out and to recognize the limitation of just uh, the things we can foresee. Sometimes the best idea, something happens, you know, that turns out, that turns what could have been a great winner into a company that's just not going to work out due to, you know, government regulations, uh, something, a product that turns out to be removed from an app store. It could be so many things, right? Uh, or a new, a new entrant, a competitor. So I'm not willing to put so much emphasis on, oh, this is where I believe the, my conviction okay. guides me to put 10% in this company. I want it to be, I want my, the level of concentration in my portfolio to be the result of its sheer performance as opposed to my conviction. I want, if a position is meant to be big, it's gonna be through its sheer performance, not because I tried to force it out okay. there. Okay, I get it. I think it's, 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 it's basically an investment style and uh, I think it's your own investment style. And I think I hear David Gardner, who is the, mm -hmm. who is the founder of Motley Fool, has similar thinking, I mean, uh, and, you know, um, sometimes I just fail to understand how can 80 companies in the world be good? You know, that's, that's, that's what mm -hmm. my point is. How can, because there is only one Tesla, there is only one Apple. Mm -hmm. Now, now they've evolved to a certain extent, you can say. So I just find it very difficult to sometimes think whether the world has 60 or 80 great companies uh, to put my money in. I mean, that's mm -hmm. where sometimes conflict is in my head, you know. I think so. that's an excellent point because, but the truth is there, there are much more than 80 companies worth investing in. First of all, let's face it. Okay. They are not all, they are not all up our circle of competence. So that's the key, yeah. right? Yeah. But there are a ton more than 80 companies worth investing in. So then the, assuming, you know, 20, 5% of the stock market is good stocks that are going to perform well. Mm. That's we are talking. We are talking hundreds and hundreds of stocks here. Right. Mm. And so, the, the way to think about it is, I think you have a good point. It goes back to Warren Buffett saying, oh, you should imagine you have a punch card, you know, yeah, and 10 punch card, you know, and, yeah. you can only invest in 10 mm. or 20. So that's the way I think when I choose a company to add to my portfolio, it's very simple. I only add one company mm. per month to my portfolio, mm. not less, not more. So that means that per year, I'm going to have only 12 ideas. I'm allowing myself to invest in. I think, I think there are at least 12 ideas worth investing in per year. I'm pretty confident with that. Okay. Or at least I, I keep having to postpone a time I can make a new company and turn my portfolio because sometimes I'm eager to invest and I'm like, ah, only one per month. So this is the one this time. So that's one comment I wanted to provide you on that. And the other one is going back to, for you know, that's this idea of only a third of stocks outperform the market. So statistically, even if you invest in 10 and you're sure those are the 10 best, assuming you're not the next greatest investor in the world, you might be, we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but assuming, assuming you're just, let's say, an excellent investor, so you have, let's say, 60% success, you're still going to have four losers out there, right? So even those you're, you truly believe are the very best businesses in the world, probably four out of 10, you're actually wrong, and they're, they're going to turn out to be average, or, or playing out bad, right? And recognizing that, accepting that we are going to be wrong at about half the time is, is kind of a sobering way for me to realize, okay, I can now accept that I, you can still have that filter, very high um, filter on what can enter your portfolio, but accepting that limiting your scope to only a handful of companies, it, you're really hurting yourself and you're preventing yourself from investing in things that are, uh, a bit of, out of your comfort zone. Okay, so I, I get it. Look, I think, uh, and you have far more experience than me, but and I'm still learning. But you know, I I was in 30, 40 companies. Then I after beer market, I realized what to do, and you know, I'm just evolving. But anyway, it's it's not about me. Uh, I, the the question which I have for you it brings me to another question. My question is, you're saying that there are more than 80 companies in the world to invest, right? And I, I'm sure there are. I mean, but then how do you find these good companies? What is a good, what is a good investable company for you? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, and we chatted about this before, how I think we, we have quite a bit of overlap, you know, in the way we, 
we find certain businesses attractive, Rajiv. Um, so yes, going going back to um, the app economy and just in general, the way I've noticed around me and just for gaming and then extrapolating it to other companies and other industries, uh, things that have really resonated with me very quickly were things that added the sense of predictability um, because again we're coming from a gaming background i've learned that businesses that have hit and miss or just uh, can can really depend on one big release is that you work for five years or and, you know the movie industry is a bit like that it can be really really challenging and so this notion of recurring revenue is very appealing uh, to me uh, businesses that are already surfing an existing trend that are basically, you know, going with the flow and are, are likely to be successful, even by delivering, you know, uh, just in line with what you would expect from their industry. So that includes uh, secular trends, such as, you know, the mi migration to the cloud, um, which is encompassing, you know, a lot of companies, both on the B2B side and uh, also just uh, the way we target consumers these days, so companies benefiting from network effects, um, marketplaces, businesses mm -hmm. are something that uh, resonates with me because they, they are successful in spite sometimes of not delivering, you know, the level of innovation that you, you could expect. So that's an interesting thing to see, right? Um, and of course, higher margin businesses. So I tend to seek uh, high gross margin businesses. I don't waste time with cyclical industrials, utilities, mm. because they are lower margin businesses. So mm. uh, this idea of fragility, you know, uh, one black swan event and your margin is gone, you're already in debt, you're going to fail no matter what. So most, if not, you know, 90% of the companies I invest in has usually a super large net cash position on their balance sheet, right? So that means a lot more cash and equivalents compared to the long-term debt. Mm. Why do I love that? Because look around us, right? We, we are in the middle of a crisis where it could become a liquidity crisis where mm. companies have a hard time raising money. And so what's going to happen? Those that have already a lot, huge cash piles, they can invest in their growth on their own. They don't depend on uh, external capital. They can actually acquire other companies at a very cheap price right now, a cheaper price than it used to. Um, so looking for companies like that, you already sitting around with the cool kids here because they, they have the means to be successful without having to deliver perfectly, right? So I really like this notion of uh, having the balance sheet for that, the high margin so that they can, even if the margin worsens for a bit, they will still deliver. Uh, so I'm not, I don't like the idea of gross versus value investor. You mentioned David yeah. Garner is a, is a yeah. bit like that too. Yeah. But, but that being said, I do, I do filter through that, the filter of growth because while well, there is that Boston consulting group a graph you know that shows how revenue growth and uh, profit mm. expansion is really what drive stock performance right ultimately gr top line growth is going to expand your free cash flow and eventually return more to shareholders so mm. uh, I, I you know it's a uh, John Maynard Keynes who says it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong mm. and in the in the way I invest I like to be directionally correct that means okay this company is a rocket ship and you know i know you're a snowflake investor so i look at snowflake and i'm like okay this company is a rocket ship they're going to be the first company to make 10 billion in annual recurring revenue of all companies that ever existed on earth right mm -hmm. so bear with me this is a company that's about 40 billion dollars today and they are, they are they are the fastest growing and the fastest going to 10 billion dollar in revenue so I look at Salesforce, I look at Adobe, you know, that are close to 200 billion in market cap today, mm. uh, give or take a little less, right? After the, the market sell. And yes, there is no way. Snowflake is not a company of this size down the line. They already have the free cash flow positive. They already have the sustainability angle mm. that I care about. And so, okay, this is a 5x, 6x, just to get to a place like Salesforce and Adobe, still great businesses, by the way, Still businesses that are still valued north of 30 times free cash flow because they are still mm. growing strong after, you know, 20 years on the public market or Salesforce. So I look at Snowflake and I see, you know, when you write an article on Seeking Alpha, you have some pushback sometimes and people pointing out, oh, this and that, the stock based mm. compensation, mm. The, the, the gap margin is not this and not that this very quarter. And 
yes, I tend to think, well, but what's the big picture here? What do you think happens in 15 years? Do you really think Snowflake is going to be a loser that's still like 40, 50 billion dollars revenue? Or is it going to be one of the biggest software companies in the world? Mm. What's based the big picture? On the, yeah, what's, what's, what's the direction here? Is it going to be a, a, an incredibly successful company? The answer is yes, I want to be, I want to be on that rocket ship. Okay, right? so, so on, on, on the selling part, I think I have two more questions and we'll end it because this is the time. Mm-hmm. It's a fascinating chat and I think you've thought through a lot of stuff, which now mm-hmm. many people don't. When, consider a scenario where Snowflake has two shitty quarters. Yeah, two quarters are not good. Will you sell it? Um, so... The way I, I tend to be extremely patient. I'm a very okay. patient investor. Okay. So okay. if I see two ba- a set of two bad quarters, I'm usually not adding any more to a okay. position. And okay. I have plenty of more, more than half of my position I don't add to anymore. That's when they enter the penalty box, if you will. So for me, not adding to a position is already making the position represent less and less over time mm. because mm. I add to my portfolio every single month. That's mm. part of the, one mm. of the thing I try to do with my service. The reason why I started publishing online and sharing my entire process is because mm. I believe the way I invest is the way most people invest. Mm. Every month you save a portion of your paycheck and you invest uh, in the stock market, whether it is in mm. uh, you know, low cost ETFs, mm. individual stocks. And I realized I was spending an absurd amount of time in research and really carefully curating uh, the, the process. And I realized I want to bring people in. I want to be able to share this with others. I want to see how people react to it. I want to see how they partake in it. And that's really what has been driving my approach. And so, yes, when I know what I'm holding a company like Snowflake, and I, I, I know the past two quarters, people, are, it's there, there's been quite a bit of a sell-off, you know, post earnings every time, but I look at the numbers I care about. So you need to know what numbers are the ones you care about that will keep you in, right? Uh, and as long as those numbers are on track with your uh, thesis and that you, you, you can see the light, you know, uh, down the line, then there is no reason to adjust the position to trim it or anything like that. Uh, so, so that's my approach in general. Okay, so you're, 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 it's fine. I mean, look, because every company goes through cycles and, you mm-hmm. know, and sometimes a strong company goes through cycles if I follow Nasim Talab, whatever Nasim, you know, it, if the company is empty fragile, it will come out a stronger winner out of through, through the cycles. It's like any high potential individual. So I think maybe that's somewhere is your thinking, right? If a, if a, if a company goes through cycles, a strong company emerges stronger through the cycles rather than weak. Uh, yeah, you think about the S curve. You know, it's uh, companies have second wins and third wins uh, depending on mm. uh, their success. They, at some point, it may plateau, but it's gonna start back again. And yeah. you're a Tesla investor, so you know that mm. for ten years that it was very hard to be a Tesla investor, mm. right? And mm. then suddenly it shot through the roof. And most of the time, the way returns work, especially in individual stocks, is that a stock is going to go nowhere, trade sideways for five years, and then in six months, it's going to generate a 300% return. Yeah. And that if you try to time in and out, if you try to, you know, yeah, you're, you're, you're going to fail for sure because you're going to sell mm-hmm. exactly at the moment, it's actually, uh, you know, the, you, the worst possible time to sell. Yeah. yeah, I think the last question before we finish, valuation. Mm-hmm. You invested in Snowflake, so did I. <laughs> I don't know what price did you buy. I bought my my price, average price is 200 and it's 138. I'm in negative. It was 300 earlier. So valuation, what is your way to value the company and see you go DCF, you go this, I think a bit of thought on that. Yeah. Um, so I don't use any DCF model. I think they are useless. Uh, I, I'm always amused by them because there is this idea of a terminal value in 10 years. So end of the world is in 10 years if you yeah, haven't that, reached that's that. funny. That's funny. <laughs> yes. So I, I always uh, like to uh, instead think again directionally. Uh, that's mm. the, the word I used before. So um, yes, I, I try to estimate what is a reasonable revenue growth rate over the, the next five to 10 years. I do try to uh, have a sense of what the free cash flow might be by then. 
and I look if what will be the valuation by then in a normal market that is not, you know, mm -hmm. what we had at the top in 2021 or at the bottom uh, in uh, March 2020, for example, and look just at what is reasonable for this company. So you cannot invest in a company that has the potential to be the next Salesforce. And we have Snowflake in mind, we have CrowdStrike in mind, and assume that after 10 years, it's going to be valued at a PE of 10. That is ridiculous to me. I still don't understand why people do that. You have a sales force today that, that is a mature company that has been out there for 20 years. And that company is valued at 30 times free cash flow if they're, even after you know, falling almost 50% from its high. So, and that's been the case for now two decades. So there is the case that could be made that even now, even now, you know, after the recent market correction, we're in for secular bear market and everything we think we know about valuation in the past 20 years is wrong. Well, if that's the case, nothing ever mattered. Nothing at all, right? That means stocks return poorly, uh, no matter what, because I look at the past eight years, the S&P return 10% on average every year, the same as the past century. So I don't see why suddenly the market is about to fall another 80%, but if it does, and it could, we're going to rise back from the ashes from there and it's going to be one of the best opportunity of a lifetime. So I look forward to that if that happens and I will be a very happy buyer uh, in that case. But going back to just thinking directionally, there is no reason to assume everything that needs to have a PE of 10, it comes down to the nature of the business itself, right? So if you are going to end up with a very high quality business that has a very strong balance sheet, that has, let's say, a subscription or recurring revenue, that is a very different quality component, even after 10 years, even a mature business that doesn't grow compared to, let's say, let's say a commodity business, right? Or something like that. So we need to always put in context. That would be my answer. There is no single valuation that you, model that you can run on everything uh, because it comes down to the type of margins, the type of revenue, the quality of that revenue uh, that, that needs to be considered. And maybe that's the forecaster in me, right? That has been used to forecast very differently depending on the type of game, the, the kind of uh, genre, the kind of audience we would target. I have this kind of uh, in my DNA because I've been doing this for, for a very long time, for 12 years in gaming. And so that's what I try to apply to, to my evaluation thinking. <laughs>